Testing, one, two, three, four. Testing, one, two, three, four. The Columbia Workshop, under the direction of Irving Reese. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight the Columbia Workshop presents the third program of its experimental series dedicated to you and the magic of radio. Tonight, the workshop will present a short radio play which is considered to be one of the finest experimental dramas written for radio, Cartwheel by Vic Knight, and also a short technical demonstration. The students of radio drama, Cartwheel is perhaps the best example of how economy of words and characterization has enabled the author to present a moving, vivid, dramatic idea containing 23 scenes, 34 characters, and covering a time lapse of 50 years in 15 minutes of playing time. To students of dramatic expression, it may be interesting to know that the 34 characters are being played by nine actors. Before we present Mr. Knight's cartwheel, we would like to take you behind the scenes for the first demonstration which the Columbia Engineering Department has prepared in conjunction with the workshop. In this demonstration, we shall have the assistance of Miss Frances Fuller, prominent stage actress, who has been featured in such plays as The Front Page, Animal Kingdom, Her Master's Voice, and I Love You Wednesday. Are you ready, Miss Fuller? What do I do? Well, just call one over here. That's it. And by the way, may we introduce you to our radio audience? How do you do? Now, Miss Fuller, we're going to let you and the radio audience in on a trade secret. First, we want to have you know, and we don't want you to be prejudiced about this, you Western, Western listeners, did you know that all of you listening from Chicago West are hearing our programs one-tenth of a second after your cousins in Australia or New Zealand or the South Pole? Yes. They actually hear us before you do, and we're going to prove it in a moment. As you know, radio waves travel at the speed of light, or 186,000 miles per second, which means that the people in the land down under, hearing these programs by short waves, get them practically instantaneously, in spite of the 10,000 miles or more. But before you in the West or Middle West hear us, the programs travel along a few thousand miles of lines, and then are broadcast by your station's transmitter. The feeble little electrical impulses which the greatest programs are reduced to before you hear them as sound, travel a trifle more sluggishly through the lead cable lines than they do when they're finally hurled out on the ether. And as a result, they slow up a bit and delay your hearing them, while in New Zealand, listeners hear the sounds the instant they are created. Oh, yes, you want the proof. All right. Stand by, Master Control. Up in our main control room, the engineers have set up their apparatus, and they're going to electrically transcribe a section of this program as it leaves here, goes to Chicago, and returns over 2,000 miles of line. Stand by, Miss Fuller. I'm ready. When I give you the signal, we'll have a little talk. And then a few seconds after it, we'll let you and the radio audience hear it as it sounded, traveling 2,000 miles. All right, Control, turn them over. Now, Miss Fuller, you're on your own. Anything you say will be transcribed against you. Oh, my. I won't say anything. You mean I have to hear my own voice? Sure. Haven't you heard it before? Yes. In the Hollywood studio projection room when I made my first picture. It frightened me stiff. Luckily, it was dark. I sneaked out very quietly, and it took them two days to find me. <laughs> Say. Well, that happens to nearly everyone when he hears his own voice for the first time. But a great many theater audiences and producers feel quite the contrary about your voice. Suppose you recite something for us. Recite? Sure. You do, and I will, too. Well, you start. All right, now let's see. Francis had a pretty voice. Its frequencies were slow. It left New York at 8 p.m., returned at 810. <laughs> Did you just make that up? Sure. Well, I'll have to do the same. Twinkle, twinkle, radio star. There's your voice, and here you are. Now you hear what others do. Oh, um... There, there. Now, don't feel blue. Bravo! <laughs> and now for the finish, I'll count a number and you follow it after a slight pause. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Cut. Cut? Cut what? <laughs> well, that was a signal to the engineers that we were finished. And now in just a moment, when the boys get their equipment all lined up, we'll hear all of that over again. May I go now? <laughs> oh, No. Don't forget, you're in cartwheel, and we're all waiting to hear that, I can assure you. I'll keep watching the control room, and as soon as Mr. Voorhees gives me the signal, I will be ready. Are you ready yet? All right, there it is. And now, ladies and gentlemen, listen to voices leaving New York and then coming back over 2,000 miles of wire.
Luckily, dog. I speak to Derek quietly and from two days to five. Well, that happened to nearly everyone here. Here's the voice for the first time. But a great many of your audience has been used to your quite quite about your voice. Suppose you recite something for us. Recite? Sure. You do, and I will too. Well, you thought. All right, now let's see. Francis had a pretty voice. Its frequencies were slow. It left, left New York, York at 8 p.m. Returned return at 8 p.m. Oh, oh. <laughs> Did you, you just, just make that, that up? Sure. sure. Well, well, I'll have, I'll have to, to do the same. same. Twinkle, 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 radio, radio song. There's, There's your, your voice, voice and, and here, here you, are. you are. Now, now you hear what others, others do. do. Oh, oh well, there, there, there. there. Now, don't feel blue. Bravo! And now for the finish, our count number, number, number and you follow it as right by chord. One... one Two, three, four, five, cut. cut. There you are, that little echo you heard with the voices returning after having been sent around 2,000 miles of line. And now, ladies and gentlemen, before the stage is set for cartwheel, we'd like to give you a little demonstration of the progress which has been made in the past few years with the most important unit of all radio equipment, the microphone. It is the heart of all radio broadcasting. And each modification of the microphone has brought with it wider scope and greater entertainment in your radio programs. You know, at one time, the letter S was the bogey of every engineer and performer in radio. Weak hearts trembled at lines like, she sells seashells on the seashore. A sudden loud sound on the old carbon microphone could blast the station right off the air. Let us show you the contrast between the carbon microphone of 20 years ago and the modern velocity microphone in use today. Mr. Ray Collins, will you help us with this experiment? Why, certainly. Ray Collins is well known to you all as a leading player in many Columbia Radio dramatic productions. Ray, do you remember Lincoln's Gettysburg Address or Hamlet's soliloquy? Well, I've played Hamlet. Good. Suppose you stand here between these two microphones and do the soliloquy for us. I'll be glad to. Now, while Mr. Collins does the soliloquy from Shakespeare's immortal Hamlet, Mr. Voorhees, the workshop's engineer, will keep cutting from the carbon mic of 20 years ago to the modern, high-quality, sensitive microphone of today. See if you notice such contrast. Mr. Collins. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing in them Die, sleep, no more. And by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that fresh as air to, to the consummation devoutly to be wished. To die, to sleep. To sleep, the chance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil? Must give it pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time? Your pressure's wrong, the proud man's contumely. The pangs of despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns of patient merit of the unworthy sex. When he himself might his white snake with a bare Thank you, Mr. Collins. Ladies and gentlemen, the changes you noticed in quality represent 20 years of research and improvement in broadcasting microphones. But quality alone has not been the only objective. As important as quality is flexibility of use for perspective. We're now going to show you the difference in pickup perspective between the dynamic microphone, which was the latest type before the velocity was perfected, and the velocity. Miss Francis, it's your turn to help. Miss pleasure, sir. Thank you. Miss pleasure, sir. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Arlene Francis, one of radio's best-known actresses. One of radio's best-known actresses. How do you do? Arlene, suppose you do Lincoln's Gettysburg... Suppose you do Lincoln's Gettysburg address for it. Start on this dynamic microphone over here and walk around it in a circle. All right. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation. Conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. 
Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place of those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. You notice that Miss Francis, who was never more than a foot from the microphone, was audible at all times, even when she was directly behind the face of the microphone. The sound waves were being picked up by reflection. This caused much difficulty in pickup. First, because the microphone had only one side into which the performers could work without this reflection effect. And secondly, because of its non-directional pickup, which allowed extraneous sounds access to the microphone from all angles. Now listen to the velocity microphone. You will notice that when Miss Francis, again never more than a foot from the mic, starts reading, she will be very clear, or as we term it, on beam. As she moves off beam in a circle, there is a gradual diminishing of her voice volume and perspective until she will be practically inaudible when she is at right angles to the beam. And finally, when she leaves the dead side of the microphone and approaches the second beam side, she becomes perfectly clear again. All right, Arlene. Four score and seven years ago, our forefathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final destination of those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. Thank you very much, Arlene. In future programs, we will show you some more demonstrations of various perspectives on microphones and their use in radio production. Continuous laboratory research on microphones promises that the next few years will bring many more revolutionary changes, all for the sole purpose of improving the quality and scope of radio entertainment. And now, Cartwheel by Vic Knight. Anyway, 
<laughs> Pretty sweet. <laughs> A 1384 cartwheel. <laughs> Get closer to the phone. I can't be wrong. There were only three of those coins. I know because I went to the mint personally and talked to a young fellow named Dempsey. The chap who turned them out. Yeah. Here's the point. You know enough about coin collectors to realize what this means to me. What's that? Precisely. Yes. With all three of those three cartwheels, I'd have the finest collection of American coins in existence. You've got to get me the other one. I won't be satisfied until I've found it. Hang this fence. I'd pay $25,000 before I'd see anybody else get that coin. You always told me, Martha. I'd make a lot of money in the mint, but I couldn't keep any of it. Gee, I never thought I'd lose my job just because I told that coin collector about that cartwheel. Just think, Martha. Once it was in my hands, I made it and lost it. Oh, but I'll find another job, maybe before the baby's born. And mark my words, Martha. Someday I'm going to get that cartwheel. Yes, sir, I'm going to get it. It may pass through a million hands. But someday I'm... Two lamp wicks, a gallon of kerosene, and a pound of your best chicory. And say, uh, how about throwing in a piece of liver for the catch, eh? Mix me up a moxie. Sweet, Capro. A pound of sugar. Well, it'll cost you a dollar, Morton. Might seem like a heap of money for you to pay, but if you send off that place I told you about for your store teeth, the whole thing won't run more than five dollars. Well, do you want me to yank out them teeth or don't you, Morton? Well, sit down then. We'll get my pinchers. And don't be wasting my time, because I got that bay mare and them three other horses to shoot yet today, and I ain't hankering to be delayed. Oh, you kiddo, there's a hokey pokey wagon. You got money, Archie. Why don't you buy some? Twenty three schedule to you. I ain't gonna waste my silver dollar that way, Aggie. No, sirree. I'm gonna hold on to it. Don't forget, the four dollars extent come to the casino next Saturday. While it is true that he impressed me as a very sincere and capable fellow, comma, Dempsey's past record shows that he was discharged from a job at the United States Mint. Period. This indicates questionable character, and I'd rather not have him in our employ. All right, boys! Come on, come on, come on here! Unlucky at horses, lucky at blackjack! 21, the old army game! One seat over to blackjack, men! One seat over to right, men! Going again! Blackjack, a dollar or not! All right, cards for the gamblers! Unlucky at horses, lucky at blackjack! 21! O oh Lord, let us be worthy of these thy blessings, and let them be acceptable unto thee. For it is more blessed to give than to receive. Amen. Now the men they'll know why they say go boy. <laughs> <laughs> Can't buy nothing 
where I'm going now. Oh. And when you get your pay, son, don't forget. All in silver dollars. Oh, gee, Dad, you still expect to find that $25,000 cartwheel, don't you? Sure I do, son. It may pass through a million hands, but I'll get it yet. Biggest and most stupendous show along the gay Rialto. The one and only Rudolph Valentino. The perfect screen lover in the chic canary. Sensational hit of the silver screen. Step right up if you try. Do please. Yes, I'd still meet the price. It's worth it. But something tells me my coin collection will never be augmented by the third and last of those 1384 cartwheels. Wonder where it is. Maybe it doesn't even exist anymore. Maybe it went down at sea, or perhaps some old granny is hoarding it in her attic chamber. Or maybe, for all we know, right this very minute, it's in the hands of a... Thief! So that's what I am, huh? A thief, just because I'm taking a dollar of your filthy money to buy myself a bite to eat. Well, I'm fed up, see? Here's your dollar, stupid. Take a good look at it. It's the last one you'll ever see, you rat. Oh, oh. Cut, cut, cut. That was putrid. Now let's shoot the whole scene over again. And for Pete's sake, Barbara, let's hear that silver dollar hit the looking glass. Only a dollar, Jim. Let's get one. Oh, but, Elsie, we don't need it, I tell you. But we will need it soon, honey. I know, but let's wait, Elsie. I, I never was a plunger. No, Jim, please. Let's get it now. I want it, Jim. Oh, but, honey, I... I've got a dollar, Jim. This old silver one. I've held on to it for a long time. Just for something like this. Please, Jim. Oh, all right. But I can't see the sense of buying a baby buggy before we've even got a baby. On the reservations, gather these precious herbs, barks, and bitters. Nature's own ingredients for nature's own panacea. Dr. Witherspoon's magic elixir. One dollar the bottle. I'll take one. Thank you. Uh, now, who else wants it? Dr. Witherspoon's magic Telegram, sir, for Mr. Hemingway. Thanks. It's collect, sir. One dollar. Oh, I see. Well, who sent it? No signature, sir. Well, come, come. I can't pay for something unless I know where it's from. After all, I'm not... It's from Nevada, sir. Reno, Nevada. Reno? Nevada? Here. Here's the dollar. Oh, but this is only half a dollar, sir. Oh, I beg your pardon. I see. It's a cartwheel. Thank you, sir. That's all right. (laughs) I've changed my mind. Stop. Taking morning plane home. Ruth. Nuts. He's been acting pretty strange, Ma, since he went to that fortune teller. Cartwheel. That's all he ever thinks about. That cartwheel. Wasting his time. Because you know he'll never see it again. Come on, Dutton, divvy it up. What's the haul? Oh, three or four C notes, I guess, counting all this chicken feed. Jeez, <laughs> I didn't even leave that cash here enough, Jack, to keep a lady bugging here in it. Nice going. Say, Spike, look at this. Holy smoke. A cartwheel. Must be sort of an antique, too. Look at the dates. Hey, 1384. Gee, that must be way back in Buffalo Bill's time. Give me it, you dumb cock. Sure. Just as I thought. What's the matter? It's a phony. No. Why, you ignorant mug. How could there be a United States dollar in 1384 when Columbus didn't even find the place till 1776? Ain't you never read your civics? Well, I ain't never had much schooling. Yeah. Here goes this phony cartwheel into the spittoon. <laughs> Snake eyes and little Stevie hiding the chamber. 
Talk, school, dad, talk. No, she out loud. Oh, Come on, boys. Shoot the work. Now, who's going to save me, huh? Come on, son. Well, who, who's going to save me? Now, what's the matter, Dad? All the cash money they can get up? You know they have no more money? Show now. All right, sir. Then I'll roll the and here it comes. Watch it. Come on, boys. This here cartwheel and go on and get yourself a bottle of gin or something else that you crave. No, no, high pockets, don't give me that cartwheel. What's the matter? Oh, give me instead a dollar bill. Here's your cartwheel is your lucky pocket piece. Your voodoo charm that you done stop with before you win yourself all that money. Oh, hush your mouth, boy. And they crack. From a devil. <laughs> high pockets can't be bothered with money that jingles. Only the kind that ruffles. <laughs> no, go on, get your gin now and let me be. I have flash in for the black light. Get going now and look here, son. Don't spend your cock me long. Say, would you would you give a buddy a dime for a cup of coffee? Yeah. Cup of coffee? Uh, yes, sir. A dime for a cup of coffee? Yeah. But why should you charge me a dime when I know where I can get it for a nickel? Hmm? It's outrageous. Ah, you don't get me, pal. I'm hungry. Awful hungry. I ain't seen food for, for three days. You still recognize it. <laughs> Same old stuff. <laughs> Same old stuff. <laughs> Here. Here, you take this somewhere out. Get ten cups of coffee. Get twenty cups. Get... Get called. Gee, thanks, buddy. <laughs> Sucker. That's 18 bucks so far tonight in the evening, young. Doctor? No, I think not. In his condition, I hardly believe he feels any pain. He cried out all through the night, Doctor. Mumbled something hardly intelligible, except for an occasional mention of a cartwheel and a million hands. Yes, yes, I know. His son explained that to me last night. Just stay with him, Miss Maxwell. He doesn't have much farther to go. $199, including the extra limousine. You've got a dollar change coming, Dempsey. Do you mind taking this, uh, this, uh, cartwheel? You are listening to Cartwheel by Vic Knight. It was a third presentation of the Columbia Workshop. Let us know how you like tonight's demonstrations and dramatic presentations. Tune in again next week at this same time for another program by the Columbia Workshops. The Columbia Workshops presentation was produced by Irving Reese. 
This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>